So we're going to talk about regulation, offshore renewable and regulation. That is a massive topic, very interesting, uh, lots of challenge, and uh, also lots of questions. Uh, today on the stage, please, can you be quiet, please? Yes, thank you. So today on the stage, we have Nessie, Jennifer, and Ellie. They will introduce themselves. They're gonna go you know, for a short presentation. Then after, we're gonna open the questions. They're gonna be in the hot seat because we want to understand clearly what is the future of regulation in terms of marine renewable energy. And uh, as I'm French, I sound French, uh, I'm gonna have you know, lots of questions because I'm very curious you know, and see if we can compare the European you know, regulations with the US uh, regulation in terms of potential development. So ladies first, uh, I'm gonna invite Nessie to come here and to, to do the presentation. Are you ready or you wanna stand? No, you say you wanna stand. Yeah, much better. You have to press it. Yeah, it should be working. Is it on? All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nessie Sumaid. I'm with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management from the Pacific region. I am the regional supervisor for the Office of Strategic Resources, and that includes renewable energy development on the OCS. I do have slides. Almost there. Almost there. Yeah. Well, this is the second slide, but the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the bureau within the Department of Interior that's charged with providing access to our energy and mineral resources under OCS. Um, and the renewable energy resource that we're primarily focused on is floating offshore wind. Um, just to first say that floating offshore wind is possible in both coasts, the East Coast and the Pacific. I'm going to focus more on the Pacific. And as you can see, there's not, the water gets deep very fast. We don't have a lot of light blue off of the Pacific coast. And so um, we're going to have a different kind of technology from what you um, are, th are been hearing about on the East Coast. Um, we're going to have floating, floating technology. Um, here are some platforms that could be seen um, from fixed bottom at less than 60 meters to floating um, technology that we will see here in, off of the Pacific. Um, there are they're just different mooring systems and different platforms so, um, that are shown in, in this, pair, this picture as well. So a little bit about where offshore wind can go. Our planning process is based on the bathymetry, right? We, for the current, uh, for the near future, we're looking at deployment in 1,300 meter depth of water. Um, also looking, our planning areas assume we go for at least seven meters per second of wind speeds. And we don't have jurisdiction in, nas in the national marine sanctuaries, and so we try to stay away from that. And so our planning process is really narrowed to begin with. Um, the BOEM process, some of you who have been in presentations have seen this, this process. It's a staged process. BOEM's leasing process begins with a couple years of trying to identify, get stakeholder input on where areas are even feasible. That's the first phase, and that usually takes <clears throat> like a couple years. In California, we started the planning process in 2016, um, and so we have advanced it over the years, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so in the planning process, we then identify areas that we first call as call areas. Those are more specific polygons on which we would then identify wind energy areas for the first of two NEPA reviews in the bone process. NEPA is reviewed prior to lease issuance. And that happens um, at the end of that first stage when we have a wind energy area. Um, leasing happens um, at the second phase. And here, we, it's a two-step. First, we put out a proposed sale notice. That's when we sort of say what we're proposing, where the lease areas are, what type of auction we're planning, and what type of uh, lease stipulations are going to be included. That, those is, goes, goes out for a, a federal register notice, and then we issue a final sale notice. Um, a lessee does not have the right to construct um, when they have a lease. They only have the right to do plans, to do site characterization in the area that they want the lease on. 
um, to inform the development of a construction and operations plan that they will then submit to BOEM for review in the last phase. And, and when we have this construction operations plan or called COP, that's when we do the second NEPA review, which is the full-on environmental impact statement. And that's when we know where the, the, the specifics of the project um, will be. And also it's noteworthy that BOEM has, has a requirement to have financial assurance in place prior to start of construction. The financial assurance has to be of the amount expected for the decommissioning cost. So um, that has to be in place before any construction begins. Um, the whole host of issues from biological to physical to socioeconomic are, are covered in our NEPA reviews. And the NEPA scoped is scoped based on what is expected to occur. So that first NEPA review I talked about was just lease issuance. And because they cannot really construct a project, the scope of the NEPA is on what they can do, like the site characterization, the surveys that the LLSI will do. Um, and then in the second NEPA, then that is more uh, a full board EIS, because that would we know physically where the projects are going to be, the layout, um, and all the manner of construction and operations as well. So how do we, how do we get information? BOEM has uh, used the mechanism of Renewable Energy Task Force. That's our primary mechanism to engage. It's an intergovernmental task force, which is because it's not a, a federal advisory um, committee, commission act, FACA. And so um, we only have members that are governmental, federally recognized tribes, federal, state, and local agencies. However, the task force is not the only mechanisms that we use for stakeholder engagement. We have several public meetings that occur. Um, all of the data that we gathered are housed in a data portal that is accessible for um, you know, the public. In Oregon, we call it AuraWind. In California, we call it Data Basin. And so all the information that we have gathered is there that is accessible for um, all to see. Uh, in addition to all the meetings, we, post, we try to post everything on our website um, and, and just have different meetings with different focus groups, like our fishing community is a very important stakeholder group. Our federally recognized tribes, our non-federally non recognized tribes, um, are also important um, interested parties in, in the development to inform our leasing decisions. Um, these are, I, I talked about all the tools we use for engagement. Um, we try to keep our website as, as updated as we can. So boatm.gov slash California or Oregon are places where you can look for what's happening on the Pacific Coast. I want to spend a little bit of time on where, where we are in the Pacific. In Hawaii, we do have uh, call areas. It's, it's, we're not doing active planning there right now, but there's, there are call areas off of Oahu on the north and the south. In Oregon, we're in the early phases in which we did identify uh, call areas off uh, Coos Bay as well as Brookings. Um, and we are going through more analysis, reviewing the comments that we received so that we can identify the wind energy areas. Next. And in California, that is where we're more advanced. So this is where you can start to see what offshore wind can do for the blue economy. We are going to announce, uh, well, we've announced an auction to occur on December 6th. Um, if you go to our website, you can see, you can start to see what could happen based on the stipulations, the engagement that we're requiring for lessees to have, the outreach and all of the reporting that they have to do, as well as um, the auction is gonna be based on a multi-factor auction format in which BOEM has evolved its process to not only include a cash bid, but a non-monetary uh, bid as well to, to promote um, supply chain investments in floating as well as workforce training. And I think for the first time too, we are doing community benefits agreement bidding credits to try to, um, to help to mitigate the impacts to communities that are affected by um, the lease area as well as the lease development. So all those are exciting things that I think are um, going to try to, to see what offshore wind can do um, with regards to you know, investing investments uh, and jobs. I said that lessees cannot uh, really construct, so we'll, as soon as we have leases, we're gonna have to, you know, survey plans are gonna be approved, um, going through our process as well as the, the Coastal Commission's process for review. 
We, we arm the lessees with guidelines. Um, so they're all on the website, all the different guidelines for everything and anything. Um, and then the construction operations plan is really that big project uh, where we see the proposal. Um, our regulations are pretty clear in terms of you know, what's expected of the lessees. And I expect that our lessees on the Pacific will, be, um, will have lessons learned from the East Coast COPs that would have been filed. Um, the things that we expect the construction operations plan to comply with. And then again, that's when we do the final EIS, which is looking at the project impacts um, and really identifying the specific project mitigations that will occur. And with that, I, th I think I'm done. Thank you very much. So the next... The next presentation and keep your questions. We're going to go afterward, you know, for, you know, interaction. Uh, the next speaker is Jennifer Lucchesi. If, if you want to use the repeater, no, you're going to stand. Good. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Lucchesi. I'm the Executive Officer of the California State Lands Commission. In relation to um, BOEM, we are the state equivalent to BOEM and BESI. We manage the offshore lands within state waters from the mean high tide line out to the state federal boundary. We also work very closely with our port counterparts in managing the state's tidelands and submerged lands. So, Generally speaking, we manage over 4 million acres of state property um, throughout the state. Like I said, offshore to the state federal boundary, we also manage about 500,000 acres inland, mostly in the California Southern Desert, but about 55,000 acres of state forested lands as well. We manage both offshore and onshore lands for a variety of different uses, um, particularly for this conference. Um, renewable uh, energy types of developments from the geothermal operations in the geysers in Sonoma County to the Salton Sea, to various wind and solar um, projects in the Southern California desert. And then now we are starting to get into the offshore renewable energy, um, offshore wind um, industry as well, both within state waters and then in partnership with our state agencies, including the Energy Commission and our federal counterparts at BOEM. So today, this morning, I'll be talking about a couple of state applications that we have um, for offshore wind, offshore Vandenberg, as well as our role and involvement in the larger um, Outer Continental Shelf offshore wind um, strategy with uh, the federal government and our sister state agencies. So as I mentioned, um, our leasing portfolio currently includes um, all kinds of different um, uh, energy industries. Uh, we were, as, a, as the State Lands Commission, we were actually founded um, to help manage the state's offshore oil and gas operations. So from that angle, we're actually actively involved in um, a couple of offshore decommissioning projects in state waters, um, facilitating um, the decommissioning of an offshore oil island and an offshore oil platform ourselves. Um, we're just about ready to move forward with analyzing the impacts of removing a state platform holly in the Santa Barbara Channel. Um, we're also just got funding from the state legislature to look at um, what it would cost the state to buy out the remaining offshore oil and gas leases within state waters, primarily down offshore Orange County and LA County. So we're actively involved in moving the state um, intentionally out of the um, fossil fuel and oil and gas industry, particularly in offshore waters. We also have been um, deeply involved in the decommissioning of the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station um, down offshore Orange County, San Diego, excuse me, San Diego County, and then we're involved with the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant, both from a decommissioning and now from an extension of operations. And as I mentioned, we're actively involved in a variety of renewable energy projects, particularly geothermal and um, wind. So we are currently processing two applications for um, uh, offshore wind demonstration or pilot projects in state waters offshore Vandenberg Air Force Base. 
One of those applications um, has been put on hold. They're just not ready to move forward um, with their project description. Um, the one application from Cademo is moving forward. We're finalizing the project description for their four turbines, Offshore Air Force uh, Vandenberg, um, and hopefully going to be releasing the notice of preparation to pursue and develop the EIR um, in short order. We're also working with the Air Force um, or the Space Force Base um, on the potential of a joint NEPA CEQA document um, to really analyze that, those state water projects. So I think you'll hear a little bit more about AB 525 from Eli from a broader um, state perspective in terms of the strategic plan that the state is tasked with developing. The State Lands Commission has a very specific role in supporting the Energy Commission's leadership of developing that strategic plan. We have been tasked and funded to um, uh, develop the uh, chapter on port readiness um, to help support our offshore wind um, industry and support BOEM's um, offshore uh, lease sales. So towards that end, um, we have a couple of different um, stages or steps to help develop that particular chapter. One is really looking at the various uh, studies that are already in um, progress, and that's being conducted by BOEM. Um, both um, looking at Oregon, the Coos Bay area, as well as California's um, port needs. Those are um, a couple of the input studies, not decision-making studies, but input studies that we will use to help formulate the AB 525 port readiness chapter. We're also um, ourselves conducting um, uh, alternative port assessment or feasibility study for the Central Coast. Um, this is towards the end of making sure we're not leaving any stone unturned and we're looking at all the different options um, to help support our offshore wind industry. So um, we are, with funding from the Energy Commission, leading a study to look at the feasibility, basically looking at screening um, different options for new port development within the Central Coast. We hope to have that um, study completed by the end of the year. These are all, like I said, input studies. Um, NREL is also starting to conduct um, a West Coast port assessment um, that'll look at California, Oregon, and Washington. We hope to use that information, again, all to feed into the AB 525 port readiness chapter. And um, uh, with the goal of identifying both um, what the port um, needs are for offshore wind, what our existing infrastructure currently can hold, what the gaps are and how we can both enhance existing infrastructure and whether we actually need new infrastructure or new ports or um, wharves or other types of inf infrastructure along the coast to support that. What are the impacts and challenges associated with both enhancing current infrastructure and developing new one? Where is the funding coming from? And then also ranking those port sites. We hope to accomplish all of that um, with our state and federal partners along with our stakeholders um, and our consultants, thank goodness, by June of next year where the AB 525 strategic plan is due to the legislature. Um, so we have a lot, a lot of work um, ahead of us. And that's just one chapter. You'll hear about the rest from Eli. Um, we certainly have our hands full. So. As um, Nessie was saying earlier, we have been involved in the BOEM um, uh, Offshore uh, Renewable Energy Task Force since 2016 with our state um, partners, including the Coastal Commission, who isn't here today, but obviously a very important regulator in this space, both from their federal consistency determination role as long, uh, along with their coastal development permit and local coastal planning role. Um, and so we're very, very excited to be at this point um, in supporting the state and the nation's um, climate goals in this way. Um, as at the State Lands Commission, we feel like we're um, extremely in, a, in an extremely unique position, both in terms of helping to facilitate the state's um, weaning off of fossil fuels, particularly offshore oil and gas, and really diving head into the offshore wind and other renewable energy um, industries and helping to facilitate that in the best way that we can. So with that, um, my presentation concluded. I look forward to questions. That was really good. Thank you, Jen. Uh, we're going to take the last presentation after we go for the question. So, Ellie, 
you work for, you're, you're the advisor for Commissioner Vaccaro. You go here. Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm going to switch. That's good. All right. Um, good morning, and i um, glad I get to come after Nessie so she can cover the depth and breadth of, uh, of the federal um, leasing actions, because that's always uh, a lot to cover. Um, and so I'll be able to focus a bit more on some of the, the energy pieces. Um, so as Pierre mentioned, um, I'm an advisor to Commissioner Courtney Vaccaro, um, the California Energy Commission. Um, the Commissioner Vaccaro is the, the lead commissioner for offshore wind. Um, and really happy to be here today to uh, provide my perspective on floating offshore wind. Um, it's definitely a technology that is beginning to emerge in oceans all around the globe um, and is poised to play an important role um, in California's climate and, and energy future. Um, by way of background, the Energy Commission, it's formally known as the State Energy Resources Conservation and Development Commission. I've never heard anybody refer to it that way other than uh, I think like some of the state budget bills maybe, um, but you may have seen it described that way. The Energy Commission is really the energy policy and planning agency um, for the state. We're sort of the, the primary. We work in partnership with um, other agencies on energy and climate, but the, the Energy Commission has one of the, the unique role of having a very statewide perspective. Um, and. Uh, one of the things that we do and we've done over the years, um, working with State Lands Commission and, and state and federal partners, um, is coordinating around planning for large-scale renewable um, projects. A lot of that work started in the California desert, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's broadened since then. And um, since 2016, has now included looking at the opportunity for offshore wind in federal waters. Um, off the state. So um, that's when we first began working with BOEM um, and uh, really looking at what that potential looked like. Um, and we've done that in uh, partnership with at least eight different state agencies. Um, that includes the Ocean Protection Council, uh, State Lands Commission, as Jennifer mentioned, um, the California Coastal Commission, the Public Utilities Commission, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, um, Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, and the California Labor and Workforce Development Agency. So we've really taken a, uh, at the state a real whole of government approach um, to offshore wind because it's such an interdisciplinary um, topic. Okay, so... I think everyone here is probably pretty well aware that California has very aggressive um, climate and clean energy goals. Um, we've been working hard and fast to transition the energy sector um, to clean electricity. And you know we're doing this in the, in the midst of a, of a climate crisis. Um, this kind of long history and being very proactive about pursuing cutting edge technologies um, you know, is really all about meeting the urgency of the moment um, and achieving um, the policies that have been put in place to really reduce the pace and magnitude of climate change. So some examples of things that the state has enacted and we're working toward, um, we've, had a, we've had a policy in place to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, for quite some time, and just recently the governor signed Assembly Bill 1279, which puts a policy in place to achieve zero, um, net zero greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, but no later than 2045, and to achieve and maintain that level um, thereafter. In the transportation electrification sector, we have very aggressive zero emission goals. Um, we have a goal of 100% zero emission passenger vehicles by 2035 and for medium and heavy duty, duty vehicles by 2045. Um, and just last, uh, just in August of this year, the California Air Resources Board established a year by year roadmap so that by 2035, 100% of new cars and light trucks sold in California will be zero emission. Um, and this includes plug in hybrid electric vehicles. 
And then also on the clean energy side, um, SB 100 or the 100% uh, Clean Energy Act of 2018. Um, it's something I think I heard mentioned earlier today and, and I think a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, that law requires that 60% of the state's electricity come from eligible renewable energy resources by 2030. Um, and that by 2045, all retail electric sales of electricity in California be powered with renewable and zero carbon energy. Um, and just this year, SB 1020, the Clean Energy Jobs and Affordability Act, accelerated this 2045 policy by putting milestones of 90% by 2035, 95% by 2040, and requiring that all electricity procured to serve state agencies in California by 2035 come from renewable and zero carbon resources. So the state has a, a suite of climate and energy policies that are um, really driving the development of infrastructure um, very quickly um, in the state. SB 100 also required that the state, um, that the California Energy Commission, the Air Resources Board, and the Public Utilities Commission develop a report um, every single, every four years, sorry. Um, and the first report was done in 2021, and it'll be updated every four years after that. And it's an evaluation of that policy to um, achieve the SB 100, the 2045 target. Um, and the first report in 2021, um, among other things, um, it found that the state's going to need uh, an unprecedented build out of renewable energy um, over the next 25 years with current technologies that are available. Um, and really putting kind of like a, a stamp on that is this table here, which shows one of many scenarios that were modeled in that report. But what, uh, what it's meant to illustrate is that um, each year, between now and 2045, the state's going to need to add about six gigawatts or 6,000 megawatts of new solar, wind, and battery storage resources. That's about a three-fold increase in battery in solar and wind than we've historically added, and it's almost an eight-fold increase in, in battery or energy storage technologies. So there's a lot of infrastructure to build um, uh, in California and, and quickly. Um, the report also included an evaluation of offshore wind as a potential resource. Um, in that report that found that offshore wind adds diversity to um, the energy system and balances out solar, um, solar and land-based wind, um, and also can offset some of, um, some of the large resource builds um, that would be required under the goals. So we're really just, working quickly on land and in water to really evaluate what it takes to, um, to reach, these, reach these goals. And Jennifer mentioned um, AB 525, so, and Nessie talked about getting to the lease sale. Um, you know, we're, we're really focused um, at the moment um, at uh, looking at how to um, pull off this lease sale in California in a way that brings all of our um, collective experience together. We've been working um, with agencies and we've been working with stakeholders, we've been working with tribes, uh, we've been working with stakeholders since 2016. Um, but at the same time we're doing that, uh, we've also uh, are working on implementing um, AB 525. So AB 525 um, is a bill that was passed by the California legislature last year it took effect on in January of this year, so it's um, fairly fairly new law, um, and it calls for the Energy Commission to develop a strategic plan by June of 2023, um, and that strategic plan is is focused specifically on development of offshore wind off uh, California's coast. Um, there are many interim reports and deliverables that are required by AB 525 um, that, along the way. Um, sort of one of the most foundational requirements um, in AB 525 was for the Energy Commission to establish um, what are called planning goals. Um, and these planning goals are meant to inform the strategic plan. 
the legislation was very specific about what the Energy Commission was to consider um, in establishing those goals and what they're used for. Um, and so August of this year, the Energy Commission established um, preliminary um, and uh, you know aspirational offshore wind planning goals of two to five gigawatts by 2030 and 25 gigawatts by 2045. Um, and so these are goals that are, are grounding our analytical process as we go about developing the strategic plan and the different components of that. Um, two reports that are uh, due by the end of this year. Um, the first one is a preliminary assessment of the economic benefits of offshore wind um, as they relate to seaport investments and also a permitting roadmap uh, for offshore wind that describes timeframes and milestones for a coordinated comprehensive permitting process. Um, so uh, a very accelerated schedule going from January of the beginning of this year taking effect and having these due this year, we're working hard and fast um, to meet those legislative deadlines. Um, and while we do that, being able to work uh, in partnership with all of our state partners that I mentioned, but also our federal partners in when you start to talk about um, permitting and, and impacts and as well as benefits, it starts to bring in local communities too. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and we're also, uh, the other pieces of AB 525 that I think are important to highlight for this group, um, the goals that were set um, also have to be used as a basically an input or a, a key foundation into identifying sea space or what it's called suitable sea space um, for uh, achieving those planning goals. Um, those are, we're underway in, in starting to identify suitable sea space. Um, AB 525 requires us to use existing data um, on offshore wind resource potential um, and commercial viability, which is clearly a, a, a really, you know, you have to kind of start there. It has to be something that you, you can build and commercialize and, and use in your clean energy portfolio. Um, and looking at existing necessary transmission and port infrastructure, um, as well as looking uh, and including important cultural and biological resource data and looking for least conflict lands. Um, so this work, you know, is going to be, uh, as it has been leading up till now, I think Nessie mentioned that we use uh, what's called data basin um, or the offshore wind gateway for a lot of our data. Um, this work for C-Space will be transparent. Um, it's going to be an iterative, proce an iterative process for sure. Um, and it's going to require a lot more engagement with tribes and state, local and federal agencies, stakeholders, ocean users. Um, continued outreach with the commercial and recreational fishing industry and maritime industries. Um, the other the other requirement that we're we're um, going to be including in this in this plan, and I won't go into detail because Jennifer talked a lot about it already. Um, but we have to have an entire waterfront facility and port plan put together that can accommodate developing those offshore wind goals and the sea spaces that get identified. And then the last big piece, and just, just as critical as having uh, port infrastructure in place, the strategic plan will also be looking at um, the necessary transmission investment and upgrades that are needed, um, including subsea transmission options. Um, it's gonna be really challenging, we know that, to develop uh, transmission that is required at the scale we're looking at for offshore wind, including just the upcoming um, lease areas, so this, evaluation is going to be very critical and, a, and, a, and an important input into the state's infrastructure planning process. Um, and so, you know, as we was we're here today, um, we're really, you know, happy to be in a in a in a good partnership and a good place with BOEM um, as they're getting ready to hold this first uh, lease auction for floating wind technologies in California. Um, and really just want to you know, try to do this any chance we get, but I think that um, engaging in outreach and education um, and the state and the federal government doing that, but as well as the industry um, doing that is gonna be really important. And I think that uh, 
you know, when we look at what's being required in these upcoming uh, lease sales in regards to um, that, can, that outreach and that education, um, it's also going to have to come with, you know, some sort of capacity building to bring tribes, environmental justice and fishing communities and others um, into, um, into the fold and at the table um, because the industry is, is, is large. It will, in the places it gets built, it will transform communities. It's going to have generational change and, you know, we have to do that in a way um, where we can maximize the benefits and, and minimize the impact. So um, I think that's all I had. My email address is here. And then also the website that's at the bottom, um, similar to uh, Nessie talked about Boehm's website and you can find offshore wind information. The Energy Commission has a lot going on um, in the offshore wind space, uh, AB 525 primarily, but other activities as well. So you can go to the website here to get more information as well as sign up for our listserv if you want to be notified of public workshops and, and notices and those things. So um, I think we're doing questions and answers now. Thank you. So my first question is, I, I was really surprised. California has a great potential in terms of marine renewable energy and we're talking about only about wind energy. Is there any other marine renewable energy plan that you're considering or developing? You mentioned the geothermal, but uh, is there any wave energy? Is there any current energy? Is there any ter thermal energy? And so that's, that will be my first question. So we'd like you know, to take this one and maybe everybody. From, from an offshore perspective, um, you know, we, we do have a wave um, energy test center that we provided a lease off of Oregon um, so that, you know, the proponent there is, is uh, accepting um, technology providers that want to test their, their units there. But predominantly, the interest that we have received, at least on the offshore side, is, is um, for wind. Okay. Any other plan? Because you mentioned another yeah, one. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, we don't have any current um, applications for um, offshore renewables other than wind at this point. I think we were, well, I know we were involved in um, helping to advocate for California to get the test center um, that Oregon actually achieved um, offshore, but we'll be watching that very keenly to see how they um, progress. Very surprising. Uh, my second question will be about, you know, marine spatial planning. Is there a strategy in California and uh, did you develop, you know, a roadmap for the, for, for the marine spatial planning, including what will be the next very important revolution, which is growing seaweed offshore and how you're going to interact with the wind, with the different energies and the seaweed cultivation? I'll, I'll try to just address the marine spatial planning part. I mean, I think states, they, they do their, you know, they've got marine planning spatial um, within the territorial seas and, and the state waters. Um, from our end, I think I talked about the, the data basin in, in Oregon where we have stored um, data, um, spatial data that we have. In Oregon, um, we're changing the process a little bit. We're actually in, including, uh, with our partnership with, the, with our NOAA family, they are going to help us to, with their um, a marine spatial planning tool to help refine how we do wind energy areas um, off, offshore Oregon. So um, there's a bit of work that's happening there using um, NOAA's marine spatial planning tool. Um, and I forget what the other question was. Yeah, and, and the next question, you know, maybe for you, Eli, because you're working as an advisor for a commissioner. Uh, I know that in Europe it's very strict and... Uh, the regulation is almost pretty much, you know, um, even more complicated than yours in California. But the first step, we know, when we want to go offshore, we look at, you know, uh, with an holistic view at all the possibilities. And these possibilities, you know, they, they should uh, take into account uh, the environment. And you mentioned that, and you're working, you know, on the environment, and this is an important point. You're working with the local communities, and I think, you know, this is also very an important point. But uh, the next step will be also to make a full assessment of all the resources because, again, you know, marine spatial planning is a key factor because uh, in the zones, in the coastal zones, there's a lot of interaction with fisheries, 
with uh, traffic, with tourism, and also with uh, offshore cultivation. So what would be you know, the, the, the mid-term and long-term vision for California when you're advising a commissioner? And what would be your recommendation in terms of how we're going to set up the ground you know, for these future possibilities? Uh, yeah, so I, I think what Nessie was mentioning with um, the data basin gateway um, that California has, there, I think there's over 700 data sets that have been added to this platform. Um, it's, it's a mapping platform that's designed to be uh, stakeholder driven mostly um, and transparent because you can download data. Um, there's rules on, on how the data needs to be um, explained and categorized that's on there. Um, and a lot of that was developed in preparation for the first call areas um, that were there. Um, it's not a like a formal marine spatial planning exercise, um, similar to like some of the work that that we did in the desert when we were looking at at um, multiple renewable technologies in the desert, but also trying to find the best places to conserve areas. Um, what we're doing in the ocean is a little different. It's not quite at that same level, but in AB 525, we're required to identify suitable sea spaces. Um, for 25 gigawatts of, um, of offshore wind. And AB 525 explains that that is supposed to um, feed into future leasing rounds um, of, by the federal government um, for areas. And so we're going to build, we've already been building off of what's been collected onto that database and website to begin the evaluation to find additional spaces to um, accommodate the 25 um, gigawatts, essentially. Um, and uh, that's going to include all of the stakeholders that you just kind of mentioned and ocean users as well as um, uh, the local community. So um, there's a lot more work to be done. I don't know if it's going to look like, uh, I don't, it's, it's above my pay grade to say we're going to do marine spatial planning the way I think that it gets defined but it's still gonna feel and look a lot like um, doing that marine spatial planning. Um, the, the complicated part in the desert that I, I can relate here is that in, in the desert, we ended up doing a, a really large land use plan um, for 22 and a half million acres. And we did that because we were looking at developing renewable energy, but there's a lot more things happening in the desert. There's a lot more priorities in the desert um, and it really turned into, it was because of the renewable energy that the feds and the states and local counties wanted to start doing this more master planning and land use planning because of this one type of development. But um, I, I think that doing broad, broad planning exercises and looking broad is really important when you're looking at large infrastructure because it allows you to see a lot of the different competing uses and priorities and, and other things. Um, so, interesting, uh, Jennifer. You mentioned you know the decommissioning of uh, platform and oil rigs. What is the vision of the Californian uh, strategy in terms of uh, switching from fossil oil-based uh, energy towards the renewable? Do you consider that uh, you need to involve you know the, the oil and gas industry and to be uh, the uh, the drivers for us you know for transitioning you know, to this uh, energy? And to what extent, you know, the regulation will help, you know, the uh, oil and gas industry to dive into the renewables? Oh, I think that um, you're already starting to see that in California. Um, a lot of the um, oil and gas uh, operators that we primarily deal with in the offshore space, they are already starting to change up their um, organization and um, future business models to either focus on decommissioning aspects. Not only is California looking at decommissioning um, the offshore oil and gas infrastructure in state waters, but BOEM is starting their programmatic EIS to decommission, I think, eight platforms in federal waters in the Santa Barbara Channel. So um, there is already that shift 
towards kind of end of life of this offshore infrastructure for oil and gas operations. So that coupled with um, the governor's um, and the legislature's vision of transitioning um, oil and gas production and uh, terminating a lot of that by 2045 is also driving a lot of the regulatory um, approaches and strategies on the onshore. So you're also seeing oil and gas companies looking at other operations, not just renewables, but carbon capture and sequestration and other opportunities as well. So um, I think that um, the big broad sweep of climate goals and legislation that's passed in furtherance of those goals um, has really driven, at least in the industry in California, to look at different options. Excellent. Uh, Nessie, you mentioned that you were working, you know, with Oregon and Hawaii State. Um, how do you correlate, you know, the different views and uh, how do you articulate, you know, the regulatory aspects and the regulations? Um, is there any common commissions that you're developing? How do you work with your, uh, you know, the other states? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, the process is national, right? We do the same thing with, with regards to leasing if there's a competitive interest. Um, I think that we work very closely with the states. And so the, the task force is formed at the request of the state. Um, in, in, in California, as we, will, uh, we have in Oregon, we have a renewable energy task force. So that's really the focus of our collaboration with, with the state agencies. And, and that's where we bring people. Um, we have the same data gathering um, portal in, in Oregon. So I think we're trying to be consistent. Obviously, the stakeholders will have different interests, right? We'll have Native Hawaiians versus federally and non-federally recognized tribes in, in the mainland. Um, but we, commercial fishing is in all of the, the, the states. Um, we will have, you know, view shed issues. So I think the, the, um, the potential impacts and, and the, the category of issues are going to be very similar. It's just, you know, the parties that will, you know, see th those potential impacts would, would be different. But there's a consistency in the bone process that we apply in, in all the states. And before I take a you know, question from the audience, uh, another question about you know, the, the federal government. How do you interact with the federal? Because we heard a lot about NOAA and their, their vision, and I think you know, they're very helpful you know, in terms of uh, prospective. Uh, but how do you deal with uh, the federal rules versus you know, the state rules in terms of regulation for this uh, future renewable energy? Maybe each of you, before we jump with the public questions. Um, I think, you know, BOEM has, the, the administration has a very um, aggressive floating offshore wind target. Um, in addition to having 30 gigawatts by 2030, there's 15 gigawatts of floating by 2035. BOEM is the regulatory agency that is charged with providing access to the OCS. And so within that, we, or, we work with our federal partners. There are consultations on on, on different um, federal species, you know, the act that we will, you know, we coordinate with the fish and wildlife folks, with, with NOAA, um, and then at the state side, we also, so there is a coordination both at the federal and then through our relationship with the states. Um, we have really had a very good relationship with California. I think from day one, we were planning this together, and I foresee that going forward when we have projects, um, we're, we're going to be, um, continuing to be joined at the hip and we'll make sure that this projects, these projects are done um, you know, in an environmentally responsible way. Uh, uh, the Energy Commission coordinates uh, like quite often with, with federal um, agencies, um, a lot of the times through, through the Department of Interior and then you know, the bureaus and the agencies that fall um, under, under DOI. And that's on land and that's um, in the water. Um, and that's even like in structures and homes because the federal government's really uh, an important partner when it comes to even energy efficiency um, and our transportation goals. Um, so there's, you know, lots of partnerships there. And um, I think as long as the door is open to have that dialogue and that partnership, the state is always, um, you know, ready to, to do that and partner and look for ways to... Um, whether it's look for ways to, to make um, implementing regulations uh, simpler and more efficient, or if it's funding opportunities, um, it's been there. So um, I think we're always, we're always ready to, to partner um, and uh, um, achieve our goals um, alongside those federal goals. So when those match up, it's really, you know, it makes it simple. Jennifer? 
Yeah, the, I completely um, agree with what Nessie and Eli said. I think the only thing I would add to that is, I think especially in the last um, four years, between our relationship with the federal government, our relationship with our state partners as well, it's been um, uh, an all hands on deck. I think we all realize the climate crisis that we're in and that it is going to take um, really close coordination and collaboration to actually build the infrastructure and the build this new industry up. And government as a whole has always been a lot better at saying, I think, no, than actually building new things, especially of late. And that is not the vision that we have now as I think a collective whole. And so it's all about all hands on deck. And I, in my 20 years of working for state government, I have never seen this type, this level and intensity of coordination, collaboration that I have seen over the last four years. And it gives me a lot of hope and inspiration in that regards. Very cool. Uh, I hope you can develop more than the wind energy because there's so many possibilities you know, in California. Now we're gonna take questions from the audience. We have five minutes. So I'm gonna ask you to come in the middle, you know, to state your name, function, and ask your question, Roy. I was sure you will be the first one. Oh, hello. Can you hear it? Did I? I'm Roy Robinson from Excipio Energy, and I have a kind of a straightforward question. Let's assume I had won the billion dollars in the lotto a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to go build a wind farm, offshore wind farm. In Portugal, they're doing the wind flow to wind flow to Atlantic. Just got done fully commissioning it. They announced it, I think, in 2017, and now it's online in four or five years. By the Boeing process, it would be 10 years before I found out even if I could do it. So why would I come here and not go to Europe or Brazil or someplace else where I didn't have to wait 10 years to do my project? What, what is it they do different than we do here? Well, that's a business decision, right, where you go. Um, but I think I'm talking about the regulatory, how long it takes to get it permitted and put in. Yeah. And, and I think once we have a lease out, then I think the onus goes into the lessees. It's as quickly as you can get your surveys, approve your plans as quickly as you can submit a complete construction and operations plan. And then we will do the environmental impact statement. So we put, the NEPA, we put the NEPA process of three more years. Boy, yeah. We, one question. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, there is a process. There is a, a NEPA. Um, it is just the nature of it. But, you know, just so, you know, we put all those time frames up there. But really, once you have a lease, the speed of development depends on how responsive the lessees are. Because I think the state, the, the agencies will, will, you know, do our darndest to get it going. We're going to have the occasion you know, to, to come back, you know, during the next sessions, you know, on this type of... Uh, um, issue or, you know, problem. You're next. Good morning. Thanks for being here. So I'm Greg Murphy with Blue Economy Strategies. I just want to congratulate all three of the agencies that are up here uh, for doing the work that you do. Uh, it's really important. And I remember, especially with State Lands Commission, Jennifer, under your leadership, as well as State Controller Betty Yee, um, being so open to innovative ideas, whether it's marine spatial planning with the Port of San Diego, uh, whether it's offshore wind and many other things too, just the openness of your agency, I think has been really felt. Um, and now we're at this point, you mentioned four years ago, how so much has happened. Now we're at this inflection point where there is a lot more happening. There's a lot more going to happen. And, and I've heard the really ambitious goals that all three of your agencies have put forward for California's leadership, for the federal government's leadership, and it's a huge undertaking. So I think in this room, you have a group of engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs, investors, innovators, uh, policymakers, public affairs professionals that want to help, right? And we're all in this together. We're, none of us are getting out of this alive. So my question to you all is, what can we do to help? You've already got a lot of plans. How can we help you implement? That's a good question. And that leads, you know, to, to uh, Don, you know, questions, you know, this morning. So, well, the government, while well, representing, you know, local government, say, well, we want to be part of this, but how can we interact, you know, with the private and the investors? And so he's asking you the same question. I don't know if we have, you know, the time you know, to answer that in two minutes, but maybe uh, 
in the most of a of an answer. I, I mean, we all we all operate uh, public processes, right? So I mean, and and thanks for the the kind words and the tee up. Um, but we all operate public processes, so there's the ways to engage there. Um, but that's not always going to meet the mark, right? The public process is what it is. Um, we also very open door and transparent and. That's why I put my email address up there. You can come find me. Um, we try to build as much coalition as we can um, as and that we really can't have the latitude to do as a state agency. Um, but I think really engaging in the AB 525 process is going to be important so that that plan when it's done is something that you can implement and something that doesn't sit on a shelf, but it can, it can go forward. And I think there's going to be key things in there they're going to be really important, whether it's engineering, like you talked about on the technical side, but there's going to be a lot of need for capacity building and providing capacity to local communities. Um, so if there's foundations and, and funds around those kind of things, I think those parts are going to be really important. Um, it's not going to go really fast, but it's going to feel really busy for a long time. Um, and so I think having resources in place um, definitely are going to be something that's important. And, and I, re I really think that what uh, our friends, you know, from TMA are doing is very essential because bringing the different key stakeholders together, you know, public-private partnership is essential. And especially, you know, when we look you to, to the energy transition and the marine renewable energy, nothing could be achieved, you know, by himself or by ourselves. So it's, it's a teamwork and we need, you know, to, to regroup, you know, all the energies and the, and the willing of making it happen. Uh, if if not, you know, there will be no future, you know, for these type of projects. Yeah. Last word. I, I just have two things that I want to announce. So BOM just issued its solicitation for study ideas. The other part of BOM also does studies. So if there are certain studies that you would, you those can come in more complete. So so those are two two notices that are out that you might be interested in. I would just add, um, and this goes to the first question that we got, and also to to Greg's comment and question is. Um, the elephant in the room is California's regulatory environment and framework, um, and it's complicated and it's a lot, but that's because we have such unique stakeholders with our tribal governments, our environmental justice communities, our local communities, and our environment, um, our beautiful coastline and all of that. So those rules are in place for reasons, but I think that... Um, if industry can focus on both establishing relationships, as Eli was saying, with us as the regulators, as the state agencies, um, in addition to our public processes, as well as working closely with the local communities, our goal, and this is the state's goal, is to really use this new industry to not only build offshore wind and meet our climate goals, but also to start creating benefits and uplifting our local and environmental justice and our tribal communities in ways where they weren't uplifted in the traditional extraction industry. And so that finding those connections and those themes to help us do our job would be really helpful as well. So um, with that, thank you. No, thank you.